There has been darkness and silence for three hours on Calvary. When suddenly Jesus pushes against the nail in his feet and he pierces the stillness of night with this agonizing scream. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the fourth saying of Jesus from the cross. It's the most anguished of the seven. We read that Jesus, quote, cried out. And that phrase cried out is a combination of two ideas, to shout and to look up. And so the idea is that Jesus, in that moment, when everything is dark, he shouts up at heaven. And some people read this and they think that Jesus is just um, quoting the words of Psalm 22. That's not really real. God didn't forsake him and Jesus didn't feel forsaken. He's just quoting, he's just fulfilling a prophecy. But look, if, he, if he's just quoting a verse to fulfill a prophecy, I don't think he would have cried out. So what's happening here? Well, here's what's happening. On the cross, all the sins of the world were poured upon Jesus in that moment. The Bible says he bore them in his body on the tree. The Bible says that God laid on him the iniquity of us all. And what do we know about sin? We know that sin separates us from God. And so Jesus in that moment takes all the sins of the world on himself. And what happened? Well, he felt this complete separation from God. And this moment, I'm thinking, is as comparable to the experience of hell itself as, as you could possibly get. In Romans chapter 3, Paul's going to explain the theological significance of what's happening in this moment. That Jesus is taking all of our sins on himself. But why? Well, he's going to be forsaken so that we can be forgiven. He's going to be declared guilty so that we can be acquitted. But it goes even further than that. I mean, here's what I want us to see is that what makes grace so beautiful, what makes Friday so good, is not just that our sins are forgiven, it's that we are made righteous. So look at Romans 3, verses 22 through 24. This righteousness, Paul writes, is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So here's what Paul is doing. He's making the case that no one is righteous, like no one. We've all sinned, we've all fallen short. But here's the good news, that righteousness isn't earned, it's given through faith in Jesus. And the word righteous is, um, is a word we think we understand, but, um, but we've just heard it a lot. So let me kind of paint a picture for you. Because the word righteous is just an idea. It could be used in any kind of uh, context. It's just this idea of proving uh, your value, proving your worth. So last year, I had a daughter that was uh, applying for a number of colleges, and, and when she filled out the application, she's asked to provide proof, proof of her worthiness. Like she has to list her grades and her test scores and whatever experiences or accomplishments that might make the case that she's worthy of being accepted, being let in. So it's not unlike a, a resume for a job or a credit application. So the idea is that in that context, you're righteous enough to get approved. You're righteous enough to get accepted. But Paul begins Romans by, <laughs> by basically writing what amounts to a rejection letter. Like, hey, your application has been denied. Your resume has been rejected. You are not, you are not good enough. But now Paul writes, there is a righteousness that's available apart from all of that. It's apart from the law. In other words, it's a righteousness that's not based on your worthiness. It's not based on what you've done or what you haven't done. It's through faith in Jesus. It's not based on your moral record. It's not based on your religious resume. It's a righteousness that comes from Jesus, that he was forsaken so that we could be forgiven. He was rejected so that we could be accepted. And look, this is what, I mean, this is what separates Christianity from every other religious system. It's, it's that this is a gift. It's through faith. Every other religious system puts the emphasis on your record, your resume. You've got to earn it yourself. So the Buddhist's eightfold path to enlightenment, uh, the Hindu's doctrine of karma with its successive phases, um, Muslims, they have a very strict code of law that they must adhere to and follow precisely in order to enter paradise. But, but the point is, all of them 
say, you got to be righteous, and it's, it's on you, your record. And Paul says, it doesn't work that way. Like, you can't be righteous enough. It's not something you can earn. It's a gift that we've been given freely through Jesus, but it's, it's a costly gift. And Paul explains in verse 24 um, how this is possible. Paul says, and all of us are justified, are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And this is what makes the gospel such good news, that we were justified freely. The word justified here, it's not, it's not just a way of saying forgiven. Um, it's not just a way of saying pardoned. It's so much better than that. Justification it isn't just um, being forgiven. It's being made right. It's, it's receiving the righteousness of Jesus. And so the doctrinal term for this that sometimes gets kicked around is imputed righteousness. And imputed righteousness helps us understand the significance of what happens on the cross when Jesus says, why have you forsaken me? Because in order for us to receive the imputed righteousness of Christ, our sin record had to be imputed to Jesus. So I've heard the gospel sometimes presented with a word picture of a courtroom. You've probably heard something like this before as well. Like that at the end of time, you stand before God and he pulls out this record of your life. And it's this big book, and in it you assume is everything you've ever done wrong, and you start to panic because it's, it's, it's a thick document, thousands of pages, and he opens it up. But as the um, illustration goes, if you put your trust in Jesus, then God opens that up, and those pages are blank, and he's forgiven our sins, and everything we've ever done wrong, it's been erased. But God's grace through Jesus is so much better than that. Because when God pulls out the record of our lives, it's not full of our sins, and it's not blank. It's actually filled with the perfect and righteous record of Jesus. It's his record, but your name's on it. The righteousness of Jesus has been imputed onto your record. And so 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 explains, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The message paraphrases it this way. God put the wrong we did on him who never did anything wrong so that we could be put right with God. Do you understand this? That What's happening in this moment? Jesus was punished as if he had done everything we have done wrong and we will be rewarded as if we have done everything he has done right. And so when Jesus is on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because our sin record in that moment is being imputed on him. And in that moment, he is making a way for us to receive the righteousness of his record. And that's what makes grace so beautiful. It's what makes Friday so good. It's not just that you had this huge debt and Jesus paid it off. It's that you are given the unsearchable riches of Christ. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight. I hope you'll join us tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow we're going to have uh, a special online gathering for Good Friday. So instead of meeting at 8 p.m. together, we're going to meet at 7 p.m. for a special Good Friday service. And then right after that Good Friday service, we're going to start a 24-hour um, uh, time of prayer that will lead us into Easter. So I will see you tomorrow night.